Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Professor Jacek Czarnecki, and I am an assistant professor in City University of New York at Kingsborough Community College. And today I was asked to give a brief lecture about the Polish cavalry. And I'll be honest with you, right from the beginning, I was very excited about this, simply because this topic is one of the most fascinating topics that I actually did research on. And I think that over the years, there was a lot of negative opinions about the cavalry, especially the Polish cavalry during World War II, simply because many people felt that cavalry was really sort of an outdated weapon. It was a, a relic of the past. They had no point of being on a ma modern ba battlefield. And so usually the approach to this topic was rather negative and filled with a lot of bias. But many people are still fascinated with this topic. And I really think it boils down to two reasons. The first being that World War II was really sort of the last time, the last war, that the cavalry was used, used on such a huge scale. But more importantly than that, I think it's a fascinating topic to many people because over the years, there has been a lot of stories, a lot of myths about them. Probably the most famous, the most repeated myth of all was that the Polish cavalry charged at German tanks, German armor, in the first few days of World War II. Um, I think that recently this myth has been debunked. When looking at the recent publications on websites, YouTube, most people know that this is a myth. It really didn't happen. But nevertheless, the years of misinformation certainly did damage. And today there's a lot of confusion about the Polish cavalry, especially in the English-speaking countries. And so I figured that today I would focus on that. I would actually focus on the cavalry's role on the battlefield and why this branch of military was still very important and very necessary to Poland in the 1930s and in the beginning of World War II. Um, again, it's a very fascinating topic because the debate over cavalry in Europe probably goes back to maybe 1850s. It's really in the 1870s, 1880s with the Franco-Prussian War that there begins to be more and more talk and writing about the future use of cavalry, um, what kind of a role they will play on the battlefield. But the topic really came to a critical point, I think, during World War I, from 1914 to 1918. Um, when somebody looked at World War I and you looked at the Western Front, so sort of that area of border between Be Belgium, Germany, and France, that was the Western Front. It ran for about 400 miles. And so when studying World War I and looking at that, that area, for the most part, it was very condensed and it was using a lot of modern technology, for example, tanks, armored vehicles, poisonous gas, machine guns, uh, flamethrowers. And so in that situation, the cavalry actually didn't play a very important role, or at least the way that they were used. And so anybody studying World War I and looking at the Western Front realized that the cavalry actually has great limits and maybe there is no role for them to play in future wars. I mean, this was common with some leaders in the military, but it was also common with some politicians um, to look at cavalry that way. However, if one would take a step back and look at World War, II, World War I, I'm sorry, in this bigger picture, then there were other areas where fighting took place. For example, there was the Eastern Front, or essentially the area with Russia, Germany, and Austria in the East. And then there was also Middle East with the Ottoman Empire. And in those two regions, there was simply more vast spaces on which the cavalry could use their maneuver maneuverability and speed. There was also less uh, modern weapons. And so in those two regions, the cavalry actually performed a much more successful role on the battlefield. And after World War I, the debate really did not come to an end over cavalry, simply because many countries, for them, cavalry was still a very important and very useful tool of war. 
simply because cavalry still could fight and maneuver in areas and geography that armor and the first tanks simply could not. I mean, we have to remember that World War I was really sort of like an introduction of modern weapons and tanks. And so for the most part, they were still not that good. I mean, they usually had um, engines that were simply underpowered, essentially, the tanks. Um, the armor many times wasn't that good. But more importantly, they moved rather slowly, some of them 8 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour. And so in those situations, the cavalry basically seemed like a better option in certain areas. And we could actually see this with some of the militaries in terms of cavalry. For example, after World War I, Britain only had 20 regiments of the cavalry, whereas before World War I, they had 28, which means cavalry was only redu reduced by eight regiments, so about one-third. Certainly not a drastic, drastic reduction of the cavalry in Britain. Modernization and mechanization of the cavalry, essentially, essentially replacing the soldier on a horse with tanks and armored vehicles, in Britain happened roughly around 1928. And then by 1935, most of the cavalry in Britain was already mechanized. In France, this process began in about 1931. In the United States, same year, 1931, when one of the regiments was actually converted um, to a completely modernized unit. The Soviet Union, about the middle of the 1930s, is where we see sort of more mechanized and modernized, mechanized and armored units and regiments compared to horse cavalry. Germany, had their first tank battalion in 1934. But by 1938, they already had six armored divisions, and more were on the way. So what's my point? My point is not to be throwing out these numbers and sort of giving a little bit of confusion, but just to sort of see the bigger picture, that when we talk about cavalry, in the 1920s, most countries began the process of converting their traditional cavalry men on horses, to mechanized units, tanks, and armored vehicles. This process roughly begins in the 1920s, but it is truly in the 1930s that most countries actually are able to accomplish this on a large scale that is very no noticeable. And so my point is that when looking at this topic from that perspective, Poland was certainly not backwards. Many times what is presented is that Poland usually didn't appreciate modern weapons. They still relied on the traditional horse cavalry using their charges, and hence some of these myths about charging against the German tanks. But the truth is, in Poland, the discussion about future use of cavalry and mechanization and tanks happened at the exact same time as in other armies. They followed the exact same trend. In the 1920s, there was a lot of discussion about it and what the future holds for these units. And then starting in the 1930s, the conversions begin in Poland. In 1937, the Polish cavalry made up about 14% of the Polish military. By 1939, so right before World War II erupts, that number dropped to about 8%. One of the reasons for that is one of the brigades was already completely motorized, the, the 10th Cavalry Brigade, and another brigade was in the process of being armored and mechanized. And so we see that the trend that is happening around the world in other armies is also happening in Poland as well. However, the only difference was that in Poland, they, it didn't happen as quickly as in some other countries. And it's not weird for this to be the case. One of the things we have to remember is that Poland received its independence in 1918, after 123 years of being under foreign rule. And so 20 years of independence was simply not enough to catch up with some of the other countries, like, for example, Britain or Germany. Germany was defeated at the end of World War I. They were restricted by the Treaty of Versailles. But nevertheless, 
they were still economically the most powerful country in Europe. And so for Poland to catch up with that in only 20 years, that was simply not enough time. And so in Poland, this process of transition from regular cavalry or horse, uh, men on horses to tanks and armored vehicles was simply a slower process in the 1930s than in the other countries, like I mentioned, for example, in Germany or in Britain. And so the cavalry was still a very necessary and very useful branch in the Polish military. And here we have to get into the situation of why. Why were they so? One of the things that many times people forget, or maybe they don't, they, they don't even know about, is the fact that all throughout the interwar years, in the 1920s and the 1930s, Poland believed that the next war will actually come with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union posed a bigger threat and a bigger danger than Germany did. And there were few reasons for this type of thinking. One of the reasons was that if a war with Germany would erupt, then there, there would be a response from the British and the French, meaning that Poland would not be alone fighting the Germans. But if a war erupted with the Soviet Union, then the chances of the British and the French actually actively helping out Poland with the military was very low. And most believed that that would not happen. In fact, Poland had a little bit of an experience with this right after World War I. In, from 1919 to 1921, we had a war, Poland had a war with Bolshevik Russia. And even though the British and the French helped out in terms of a little bit of military, a little bit of loans, Overall, Poland was left on its own to stand up to Soviet Russia and fight that war. And so that is why it was believed that if a war erupts in the future with the Soviet Union, Poland will have to face them on their own. And so they posed for them a bigger danger throughout that time period. And we have to realize that it wasn't just sort of this thinking based on history that Russia and Poland are enemies for many years. It wasn't also based on ideology that in the Soviet Union we have the Bolshevik Revolution, we have the ideas of socialism and communism, but it was purely based on practicality. And what I mean by that is the border between the Soviet Union and Poland was a very long border. And the Soviet Union did not accept it. And so the war breaking out in the future, Poland believed was inevitable. And they simply didn't have enough military, enough equipment in order to protect that border. It was estimated that one Polish infantry was able to defend about 16 to 18 kilometers of the border. But the reality was, working with the numbers that they had, one infantry division had to protect as much as 25 kilometers, which means that there were serious gaps within the border um, in terms of Poland not being able to protect it. And then we have to look at the other side. How would the Soviet Union attack? What was their tactic? And that tactic, tactic was not much different than the one that Germany was using. Fast offensive movement, usually on the flanks, on the sides, and then encircling the enemy from the back. Um, again, Germany was doing the same thing during World War II. So this is the reason why the Polish cavalry actually played such an important role in the military. And usually the cavalry, for the most part, was put on the flanks, on the sides of major army units, so that their speed and maneuverability was able to protect the sides. And that was the importance of this branch, that they could be moved quickly from point A to point B and reinforce the areas which were most at danger. And so this was the thinking in the 1930s. And the Germans ha actually had to learn this the hard way because when we fast forward, Germany invades the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, in 1941. And what we see is that in the next few years of the war, German cavalry units actually begin to go up, increase, and not decrease. At the end of World War II, Germany had seven cavalry divisions 
which is not that much different from World War I. In World War I, they had 11 cavalry divisions. So that number kept on going up throughout the war. Plus, on top of that, Romania gave six cavalry brig brigades, which were also converted to divisions in 1942. And again, the number kept going up all the way until the end of World War II. So we see that even later on in Germany, in the invasion of the Soviet Union, they realized the importance of cavalry in this geographical area. And again, one of the reasons for that is geography. In this region, that border between the Soviet Union and Poland, there was not too many modern, modern roads. Last figure I saw was that about 6% of the roads were modern. Everything else was dirt roads or stone which means for armored vehicles, that created huge problems, especially in the winter with the snow coming and then snow melting in the autumn or the spring, it created a lot of mud. It created a lot of problems for armored divisions. And to that situation, Calvary actually played a decisive and important role. So the truth is, in the 1920s and the 1930s, the Polish thinking about defending their country in the East was not backwards. It was actually very practical and very realistic in terms of predicting how the future war is going to look like. The other thing we have to take into consideration is that simply there was not enough, not just armor, but the, more goes into it than just looking at the numbers. I think many times people get caught up with looking at the numbers. How many tanks Germany had? How many tanks did Poland have? And this is a very simple way of looking at the situation because the truth is that even if Poland had more tanks than Germany, that would not guarantee success. And one of the reasons for that is you need technicians. Um, you need to repair those tanks, maintain those tanks. You need to have factories and industry that is able to produce spare parts. And most importantly, you need oil. Poland did have oil, but again, the capacity of refining it and using it was very limited in the 1930s. And so that also became sort of an issue. It's not just about how much armor you have, how many tanks you have, but also can you sort of maintain it? Can you sort of provide them with the fuel in order to move them from point A to point B? And more importantly than that, Poland actually had to develop more and better, I should say more modern and better tanks and armor than there were, there was in the 1920s and the 1930s. What I mean by that is that most tanks in the 1920s and early 1930s were actually rather slow. And the reason for that is that most armies had that mentality of using armor, using tanks as infantry support vehicles which means that their speeds were very low. And when we look at defending the eastern border against the Soviet Union, you have vast distances. It means that you need to have your tanks and armor and cars move quickly from point A to point B. And so you cannot really use these infantry support vehicles, which really were available during that time period. I mean, Poland didn't have enough of their tanks, enough of their armor, so they tried to buy from other countries, like for example, from France. But what they bought was the Renault R35 tank, which again was an infantry support vehicle. It was slow. It was underpowered to essentially be used on the Eastern Front against the Soviet Union. So they needed essentially time to produce different weapons. And they, they actually put themselves on the road of doing that. In the next few years, they would have the 4TP tank, the 10TP tank. Both of them seemed very promising, and both of them seemed like they would be very good tanks going into um, the 1940s. But again, they were not in production when World War II began. Um, and so that's another thing that we really sort of have to take into consideration why the cavalry was still very important, even if there was enough 
tanks at that time, sometimes numbers don't matter. You have to look at the other things. You have to look at, again, the maintenance, the spare parts, the technicians, the factories and the industry that could produce all of that. And simply, they were not available in Poland in 1939. And so there had to be sort of this reliance on the cavalry. This is why these units were so crucial for their speed. And one thing we have to remember that Polish cavalry did adapt to modern warfare. They did not use these typical charges that you saw back in the days. In 1921, a Polish cavalry training center opened up in the city of Grudziądz. And right from the beginning, they already went into the task of figuring out what the future of this branch is going to look like. How to use it, how to use mechanized units. And right from the beginning, especially Inspector General of Cavalry was basically behind the idea of using modern weapons, machine guns, working together with airplanes, working together with tanks. And he was not the only one. There was actually many people in the school that favored modern weapons instead of sort of more traditional way of fighting for the cavalry. They essentially saw the limit. And many instructors were teaching the same thing. In the early 1920s, there were instructors who basically said that, look, if you took a soldier in the beginning of World War I, 1914, you took them and you placed them in 1918, four years later, they would not know how to fight. The battlefield and the weapons changed so much that they would simply be lost. So what the point is? The point is that the cavalry needs to adapt as well. They also need to change for the modern battlefield. And so the traditional charges were discouraged. In fact, there was only three ways and three reasons why charges were still seen acceptable on a mo modern battlefield. One of them was a surprise attack against an enemy that did not have enough time to get their artillery and machine guns ready. So a surprise attack. But even that sort of came with a warning. And the warning was that it took one soldier who did not panic to get a hold of a machine gun and the whole charge could have been massacred. So the person leading the charge had to take that into consideration when ordering the charge. So the first way is by a surprise attack on a enemy that is not prepared. The second reason for a charge is on an enemy that is retreating and they are defeated. And the third reason for a charge could be against another cavalry. During this time period, there was over 20 cavalry divisions in the Soviet Union. And Germany, in the beginning of World War II, also had a cavalry division, which was stationed in East Prussia. So these three um, points were still allowed and seen as acceptable for a cavalry charge to take place, but no other reasons. And in fact, it was always recommended that any time the cavalry moves or does anything on the battlefield or near the battlefield, it's going to be protected by artillery and machine guns. And in fact, I, since the early 1930s, I believe 1933, anti-armor training was the standard for cavalry units in this school. And so definitely they did adapt to modern warfare. And they did have the weapons for it. Um, but before I talk about the weapons, there's actually one more point that I forgot to mention, and that is that sometimes you did find horses on the battlefield. And this kind of might lead to a little bit of confusion, but these horses were not there in order to fight or to be used for fighting. Essentially what happened is there were certain weapons that were transported using horses, like for example the 37 millimeter anti-gun, anti-armor gun. That was transported using three horses. And so these horses sometimes might have gotten onto a battlefield in order to sort of put that cannon into the place that they needed to, and then they went off the battlefield, essentially. And so this is why sometimes horses were seen on, uh, on the battlefield, but they were not there for fighting. They were essentially there just to put different guns in locations that they needed to be. Um, for the most part, again, horses were used for transportation. So how did the cavalry was supposed to fight? 
the most important thing that they possessed, again, is the horses, the speed, the maneuverability. Once they got to the battlefield, they were supposed to dismount, and they didn't fight differently than an infantry unit. And horses were kept back away from enemy's fire in order not to essentially kill them, right? Because they are used for transportation. So they shouldn't be anywhere near, near the battlefield and a place that could put them in danger. But again, we have to remember that the cavalry also had the weapons to fight a modern war. Like I just mentioned, there was the 37 millimeter anti-armor gun, which was a very good gun at that time. In 1938, a new Polish-made rifle, anti-tank rifle, was introduced, um, which was able to penetrate any German armor, armor from 100 meters away which means that no other military in the world possessed a rifle this good and this powerful. And this rifle was primarily given to the cavalry units. So they certainly had very good rifles in order to fight the Germans. They also had planes, they had machine guns, um, and they had tanks in their possession. And so Poland certainly did have modern weapons in order to fight this war in 1939. I mean, we cannot forget, in fact, that Poland was one of the first countries to use armor at war. In 1919, tanks arrived from France, the Renault FT-14 tanks, and immediately, being taken down from trains, they were transported to the east to fight Ukrainian and Russian infiltration. And so already from 1919, Poland was using armor and tanks on the battlefield. And there was a lot of training in that. So the point is, again, Poland certainly had these modern weapons to fight on the battlefield in 1931. And that many times throughout history was twisted a little bit. And people believe that this was still a backward looking sort of institution and branch, which certainly it wasn't. Now, there were a few things that might be seen as backwards. For example, sabers. Calvary still had sabers, but it wasn't really that weird. I mean, we have to remember that in Germany, cavalry kept their sabers all the way until 1941. So yeah, they might have been a little bit sort of outdated weapons, but again, Germany, all the way until 1941. And another weapon that there is usually a lot of confusion about is the lance, those long poles that supposedly they were charging against armor and tanks. Um, and there's a lot of confusion about that because there's actually a lot of photographs, a lot of images that show cavalry in the 1930s using lances in training. But again, we, got, we have to be very careful about this. It's sort of like that Rocky movies where Sylvester Stallone is training for this big boxing match. And one of the things that he has to do is catch a chicken. Again, seems weird. It seems like old school, outdated. But yet, that was a training for eye-hand coordination and for speed. This was a very similar concept to using lances in the 1930s. Lances were supposed to be used for training. So it was supposed to be treated as a sport. Using a lance essentially trained a soldier on the horse for better balance, better grip, better control over the horse. And that is why usually you see lances with Polish cavalry in the 1930s in, in the trainings. They were not meant to be used in battle, just for training purposes. In fact, they were taken out of in, uh, inventory in 1934. So that is sort of that situation dealing with the sabers and lances. Again, they were not supposed to be used at war in battle, especially not in 1939. I think some of this confusion over the years came from few sources. One of the sources is, of course, German propaganda. The other source was definitely Soviet propaganda during the communi communist years. And there is also, I believe, one more source where some confusion might have origins, which many times is not talked about. And that is the fact that Poland had few units that were sort of not regular units of the military. And what I mean by that is that Poland created in 1924 the Border Protection Corps, or Korpus Ochrony Pogranicznej. There was also the National Defense, Obrona Narodowa. And also in 1932, there were cavalry units known as Krakusi, 
And for the most part, they were made up of re reservists and essentially volunteers. And for the most part, they did use their own horses, their own uniform uniforms, and in some cases, their own weapons. So yeah, sometimes they did fight with lances and swords and really sort of outdated weapons. But the problem is they were supposed to protect the border. They were not part of this regular military that the cavalry made up. And I believe that the German soldiers during their invasion, not making the distinction between these units also created a lot of confusion over the years that possibly sort of led to this belief that cavalry was using outdated and old weapons. Um, and so we see that cavalry was still a very necessary and a very important component of the Polish military. And yes, the war did not come first with the Soviet Union. It came with Germany. Germany invaded in 1939. But still, when we actually look at the campaign, when we analyze those three, four weeks of fighting in September, we can see that Polish brigades were still very effective against the German units. And there are many examples of that. I could just give you one, and that was on September 1st, the Battle of Mokra. The Wałęska Cavalry Brigade was able to stop for a whole day the 4th Panzer Division. And they were supported by planes, they were supported by inf infantry, motorized infantry, and they tried to advance forward five times throughout the day, and yet this, for the most part, one brigade was able to stop them, which was very impressive. But again, it's a good example to show that they still performed very well on the battlefield in 1939 and certainly had the weapons to stop uh, armored and motorized divisions of the Germans. And so, one other interesting thing that many times is forgotten that even World War II really didn't bring an end to cavalry when we think about it. Because at the end of World War II, the Soviet Union still kept active cavalry divisions, actually a, a, a quite number of them, over 20 of them. In fact, when fighting in Korea from 1951 to 1953, there were some people in the American military that basically noted that Soviet cavalry was able to move over geography and terrain that American motorized units simply could not do. Even more recently, the invasion of Afghanistan 2001. In 2002, cavalry was still used, soldiers still used horses fighting in Afghanistan due to the geography of the region. Uh, many countries, many cities around the world, many police departments still use cavalry, still use police officers on horses in cities. So it hasn't completely disappeared till this day. Again, it depends on how you use it, the geography. Sometimes it could be a lot more effective than modern weapons like cars or tanks. Therefore, the title of this lecture was Horsemen in the Age of Armor, Polish Cavalry, to present that cavalry still had a role on the battlefield, even though we are looking at modern weapons like tanks and armored vehicles and machine guns. Thank you so much for your attention. My name is Jacek Czarnecki, and this lecture was given from Piłsudski Institute here in New York City.